if you had started about 70 years ago and you had said to leading minds around the world, what is it that the world needs now? You know, they wouldn't have said what they should have said. They wouldn't have said, uh, you know, love. That wouldn't have been what they thought of, even though they probably did need love back then. But what they would have said was that what the world needed most was democracy. That the world at that time was a world with very few democracies. But if we could just spread democracy around the world, we would solve all the problems that humankind faced. And indeed, the period since the Second World War has been an extraordinary explosion of democracies around the world. And today, it's only rogues who would deny the idea of rule by the people. Rule by the people is the central organizing concept for every government, regardless of how they interact. But if you ask the people around the world what they think of this system of rule by the people, most of them would say it's, you know, not so much. Not so much. There's such deep cynicism, skepticism about the effectiveness of democracy in delivering on its promise. And I think it's important, incumbent on us, to look back at this great success producing this failure and ask why. What's brought us to this place where we achieved what our grandparents said we needed to achieve, democracy everywhere, but we haven't achieved what Democrats thought democracy would produce, the belief of the people that they rule. And I think that we need to recognize in this a kind of system systematic blocking the mechanism of democracy everywhere, and have to ask, why is this blocking allowed? The standard answer, the kind of Transparency International answer, is to paint a broad swath of red paint across the, the world and to point to all the corrupt regimes around the world. And indeed, there are many corrupt regimes around the world. And to point to that, quote unquote, corruption and say that corruption is the reason democracy fails. But in the happy golden regimes, we don't have corruption. So in the golden regimes, democracy shouldn't be failing. But what I think we need to recognize is indeed there's not just one kind of corruption. There's not just the illegal corruption. There are corruptions that exist in all democratic regimes. They are different forms in different democracies. But they are a corruption of the basic idea of democracy. And we have to understand something more about that basic idea, something fundamental, implicit, but ignored in the idea of democracy. I think it is finally time that we recognize this fundamental principle and find a way to respect it. So, something old. Um, if we started in this beautiful place, we flung ourselves about 5,200 miles to the southwest, we'd end up in a place called El Paso, Texas. And if we then climbed into our time machine and spun it back about 90 years, we'd end up in old El Paso, Texas. And if we wandered down to the center of old El Paso, Texas, and were lucky we'd run into an extraordinary man named Dr. Lawrence Nixon. Dr. Nixon had moved to El Paso in 1910. And every two years between 1910 and 1922, Dr. Lawrence Nixon walked down to his polling place, paid his poll tax, and voted. But in 1923, when he walked down to his polling place and paid his poll tax, uh, I'm sorry, in 1924, when he walked down to his polling place, paid his poll tax, and tried to vote, he was told, Dr. Nixon, you know I can't let you vote. And he responded, I know you can't, but I've got to try. Now, the reason he couldn't vote was that Texas, in 1923, had passed a law that said that the Democratic primary would be an all-white primary. By law, it explicitly said African Americans, Negroes, were not permitted to vote. Only whites could vote. So they had a system in Texas where there was a general election where, in theory, all people could vote. But before the general election, there was a white primary where only whites could vote. So to run in the general election, you had to do well in this white primary, a two-stage process 
which through this filter excluded 16% of the Texas population in this critical first step of choosing representatives, with the consequence, obviously, of producing a democracy responsive to whites only. Okay, now Texas, it turns out, hadn't invented this ingenious technique to defeat democracy. It was invented by a great American political philosopher, the criminal Boss Tweed. Boss Tweed, who ran the New York political machine, Tammany Hall, famously quipped, I don't care who does the electing, as long as I get to do the nominating. The nominating. Now, this conception of democracy is a particular conception we should identify and name. Its name is Tweedism. Tweedism. And Tweedism is any end-stage election process where there is a stage, critical stage, essential step, controlled by the Tweeds. And the Tweeds, by their control, affect a filter that narrows the range of options that the rest of us have when the rest of us are permitted to exercise our franchise to vote. That is its name, Tweedism. And the consequence of Tweedism, obviously, is to produce a system responsive to the Tweeds only. So think about Hong Kong last summer, where hundreds of thousands of people led by students turned up under the streets to protest a law, a law defining the way in which the chief executive would be selected in Hong Kong. So the law said the ultimate aim is the selection of a chief executive by universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures, a nominating committee. Now, that nominating committee would be comprised of 1,200 citizens, which means that out of a population of 7 million is about 0.02% of Hong Kong. So 0.02% is a really tiny number. There it is, as small as you could see it here. If you thought about how it stood relative to all of Hong Kong, this is what 0.02% looks like, this tiny, tiny fraction who get to choose the candidates that the rest of Hong Kong gets to vote among. So 0.02 are the tweeds that filter the choices that the rest of the citizens get to vote among, and the view of the protesters was that filter was biased. Because the 0.02% would be, quote, dominated by a pro-Beijing business and political elite when you excluded 99.98% from this critical first step, the consequence, obviously, would be to produce a democracy responsive to China only. Now, all of these cases are obvious to us. So why is it not obvious, at least to Americans, that this is also a case like the others? So in the United States, we take it for granted that campaigns will be privately funded. But we need to recognize funding is its own contest. Funding is its own primary. Because members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70% of their time dialing for dollars, raising the money they need to get back into Congress or to get their party back into power. And as they do this, they develop a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do might affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shapeshifters, as they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money, not in issues 1 to 10, but in issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, Always lean to the green. And to clarify, she went on, you know, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> so B.F. Skinner gave us this image of the Skinner box, where any stupid animal could learn which buttons it needed to push to get the sustenance it needed to survive. We need to recognize this is a picture of the modern American congressperson. As the modern American congressperson learns through a similar process which buttons need to be pushed to get the sustenance that his or her campaign needs to survive. This is a primary two. It's the money primary. It's not a white primary. It's a green primary. It's one stage, a critical first stage in a multi-stage election. And so we need to think about who are the funders in this critical first stage. Who are the people who make the selection that chooses the candidates that the rest of us get to vote among? Well, in 2014, 5.4 million Americans gave even a dollar to any congressional campaign. 
the biggest funders spent, the top 100, spent as much as the bottom 4.75 million combined. But if you want to think about the relevant funders, the top 100 is probably too restrictive. So let's think about who gives enough such that the amount they give makes the candidates think about what they care about as the candidates are dialing for dollars. If it's $100, the candidates don't care what you care about. If it's $10,000, the candidate obviously does care. But let's say, what if we think $5,200 is the amount that makes it so the candidate cares enough to worry about what you care about? Now, 5,200 is the maximum amount you can give to one candidate in an election cycle. Turns out, in 2014, 57,874 Americans gave $5,200. Those of you doing the math, you'll realize 57,874 Americans is 0.02% of America. 0.02% of America. Dominating this first stage, selecting the candidates that the rest of us get to vote among. A tiny fraction of the 1%. We could say a Chinese fraction of the 1% dominating this first stage with the consequence, obviously, of producing a democracy responsive to the funders only. This Princeton study, which as a Harvard professor I'm not allowed to talk about, so I'll put it off the stage really quickly, by Martin Gillens and Ben Page the largest empirical study of the actual decisions that our government has made over the past 40 years, actual policy decisions related to the attitudes of the economic elites, organized interest groups, and the average voter. So what they found for the economic elites was, as the percentage of economic elites who support a policy goes up, the probability of that policy being enacted goes up as well. So if you go from 0% supporting it, you have 0% probability to 100%. You have about a 34% probability of that policy being adopted. Intuitively, that's the way you would expect things would work in a democracy. The more who support an idea, the more likely it is it will be passed. Same thing with organized interest groups. The more groups who support a policy, the more likely it is to be passed. Here's the graph for the average voter. That's a flat line, literally and figuratively. What that's saying is, as the number of average voters, the percentage of average voters supporting an idea goes from 0% to 100%, it has no effect on the probability that that policy change will be enacted. As they put it in English, when the preferences of the economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled for, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near-zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy. In a democracy, the average voter's views don't matter to what the government does. Right, so here's the picture we had of democracy. It's a particular picture of American democracy, right? There's kind of we the citizens. That's kind of the way in the middle of America they would look, right? So here we are driving the bus. This is the theory of democracy. This is the reality of the American democracy. The steering wheel <laughs> has become removed from the wheels. We don't control the direction of this bus anymore. We, the average citizen, that is controlled by something else because we have adopted Boss Tweed's regime for funding campaigns. That's Tweedism in America. Okay, that's the old part. Here's the new part. Once you have this idea of Tweedism, I want to tell you three things that should be obvious. Number one, Tweedism is corruption. Corruption. I don't mean brown paper bag corruption where cash is secreted to members of Congress in violation of bribery laws or influence laws. I don't mean a kind of Rob Lagojevich corruption, politicians selling offices for personal gain. I mean corruption of a system, a corruption of the system of representative democracy. The framers of our Constitution gave us what they called a republic. But by a republic, they meant a representative democracy. And by a representative democracy, as Madison described, he meant a government that would have a branch that would be, quote, dependent on the people alone. So this was their idea, an exclusive dependence. And they had this conception of an exclusive dependence in contrast to the British parliament. Because at the time America crafted its constitution, it looked to the British parliament as a corrupted institution. 
Not because members of parliament took bribes. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But the corruption of that institution was constituted by the rotten boroughs, which were places where the king could effectively select the representatives who would sit in the House of Commons. And therefore, because the king was controlling the House of Commons, he corrupted the institution of parliament. It was corrupted because of an improper dependence on the king. There was a competing dependence rather than an exclusive dependence on the people alone. Okay, but what Tweedism is, the whole thing that Tweedism is, is an extra dependence, a competing dependence to a dependence on the people alone. It is a corruption of the system of exclusive dependence that they designed. Okay, that's number one. Number two, Tweedism is also inequality, inequality. Okay, now this is a hard word for Americans to utter right now. Um, So confused is it and so depressing is it to continually have to talk about equality uh, and the fights for inequality, for equality. But when I talk about equality here, what I'm not talking about is wealth inequality, though, of course, the inequality I'm describing helps produce wealth inequality. I'm not talking about race inequality, though, of course, race inequality also is a product in part of the inequality that I'm describing. I'm not talking about speech inequality as if the Constitution would mandate that we all speak with the same influence. I'm not talking about sex inequality. I'm talking about citizen inequality, inequality as citizens, the inequality of voice that is implicit in a system where a tiny fraction has the power to direct policy as our system allows. Rather than the ideal of an equal voice, it's an inequality because there is no equality of voice in the system, because that is what this corruption does. As George Orwell gave us this famous idea, all all animal, all Americans, all Americans are equal, but some Americans are more equal than others. It's all Americans are equal, but tweeds are more equal than others. That is the reality that has been produced by the system that has evolved. And we should remember, this was not their plan. Because when Madison described a system dependent on the people alone, he then went on in Federalist 57 to tell us who the people were. Now, of course, he was not much concerned about African Americans. And he wasn't much concerned to make sure women had equal rights. And he didn't even know what sexual orientation equality would have been. So there are lots of equalities he wasn't worried about. But what he said in Federalist 57 was, by the people, he means not the rich more than the poor. Not the rich more than the poor. We were not to become an aristocracy. We are to be a system that through a a commons-like institution, the house, which was dependent on all the people with equal power, we would not be an aristocracy. We would be a representative democracy. But if we have a system responsive to the funders then, of course, that's a system responsive to the rich more than the poor. This is the product of unequal citizens, unequal citizens, which means that every single important problem that the nation has to address, from climate change to tax reform to the debt, you pick your problem, that problem cannot be addressed in a way that's responsive to the will of a representative democracy. Okay, now what's puzzling to me about this whole story is, you know, I've been in this debate for about eight years and I talk to all the kind of policy wonks about this debate. They look at this and they say, this is a campaign finance problem. Campaign finance problem. They look at this and they say, campaign finance problem. And it's a kind of weirdness that would lead someone to speak like that, I think. I mean, it's the sort of person who would look at this picture and say, this is a plane with an altitude problem. (laughs) Or look at the Titanic and say, this is a ship with a course problem. Or look at these people and say, these people have a liquid intake problem. Right? The point in all those cases is that's true, but it's missing the point. It's missing the most important part of the story. This is not a campaign finance problem. This is an equality problem. It is an equality problem produced by a reality of unequal citizens inside of a system which at its core is to be a system committed to the idea of equal citizens. That's number two. Number three, 
Tweedism is obviously not the only equality problem built into the American democracy. We have tons of citizen equality problems in the American democracy. We vote on Tuesdays. For stupid historical reasons, we vote on Tuesdays. What that means is people who really work for a living, people who can't just take off their job, have no easy way to vote. In many states now, people have to have voter IDs to vote, which means for all sorts of people, the ability to vote is being denied. There are only 90 seats in the United States Congress out of 435 that are actually competitive, meaning one party could win or lose in each election cycle. For the rest of them, the 345 other seats, you know precisely which party is going to win, which means if you are not in that party, you are never represented by the representative in Congress for that party. We have what we call winner-take-all, what you call first-past-the-post system for choosing our representatives, which produces this systemic inequality. In 2012, the uh, New England section of the United States uh, has some Republicans, it turns out. There were 40% of Americans in New England who voted Republican. They got exactly zero seats in the United States Congress. This huge gap between what people believe and want their government to represent them for and what their government actually represents them for because of this designed inequality inside of our system. All of these are denials of equality. All of these give ordinary people reasons to disengage from the political system. Why turn up and vote if you know you can never win. There's no reason to engage in a system that denies you the equal standing inside of the system. And this is because the government has become not responsive to them. Now, of course, an echo of this happened here just this month as we had an election here, which manifested a similar kind of denial of equal power inside the system. When you have um, the Scottish National Party getting a member of parliament for every 26,000 votes, but the UKIP getting one member of parliament for every 3.9 million votes, one looks at that system and asks how this is a system that, e that gives equal standing to all citizens. But here's the point, right, the central point. We need to have a recognition of a fundamental principle that in the history of democracy has been too far buried inside of the rhetoric we engage when we have the democratic practice of democracy. And that principle is this principle of equality, the principle of equality of citizens. And what we need to do as democracies is to test every single structure that we set up from the system for choosing representatives for the system of deciding when voting will happen to the system for funding campaigns against this single principle. Does it respect the equality of citizens? Now, in America, the number one inequality is money in the way we fund campaigns. There's much more after that inequality, much more after that that we can see once we focus on the issue of inequality as the central issue in determining whether a democracy lives up to the ideals of what a democracy is to be. Okay, that's new. Here's the part I'm going to borrow a bit. Tweetism is fixable. Fixable. Analytics for fixing it are easy. If the problem is members of Congress are spending tons of time raising money from this tiny, tiny slice of America... The solution is that they find a way to spend less time fundraising, but fundraise from a broader swath of America. The solution is public funding systems that spread out the funder influence so that tiny groups, concentrated groups, don't have such enormous power inside of the political system. And to do this, we don't need to amend the Constitution. A single statute could change the way elections are funded, and it could be passed tomorrow. So, for example, we had for many years in the United States public funding of presidential campaigns. Every president between Nixon and Barack Obama was elected on the public's dime. No candidate benefited more from this than Ronald Reagan, 
who ran three national campaigns on the public's dime. There would never have been a President Reagan had there not been public funding because in 1976, when he ran, there was no way rich Republicans were going to support him taking on a sitting president, Gerald Ford. And the striking fact about the system that that produced was a system where people could govern rather than fundraise. When Ronald Reagan ran for re-election, he attended eight fundraisers. When Barack Obama ran for re-election, he attended 220 fundraisers. Now you just wonder, how can you run the nation and attend 220 fundraisers? But the reality is this system of public funding is hated in the United States. It seems arbitrary, it's top-down, bureaucratic, the government decides how much money each side gets. Lots of reasons why people don't like this system. So the alternative to top-down public funding is a kind of bottom-up public funding through citizen funding regimes that allow citizens to amplify their influence with public funds to make it possible to run winning campaigns without ever taking contributions from large contributors. And there are Democratic ideas for this and Republican ideas for this. So a Republican idea for this is what we call vouchers. So think of a voucher as a kind of Starbucks card for democracy, like everybody gets these stored value cards. And you can allocate the money in that card to candidates if those candidates agree to take vouchers only, plus limited contributions, let's say of up to $100. So if we imagined a $50 voucher and then they could take a $100 contribution, the vouchers alone would be about $7 billion in the election system. In 2014, the total amount spent in Congress was $1.5 billion. So that's real money. But the critical fact is it would be real money coming from the many, many, not from the point zero, two. So when the candidates were responsive to the people who were giving them the money, they would be responsive to all of us, not to the point zero, two. So uh, Jim Rubens, who ran in the Republican primary for Senate in New Hampshire, has proposed this voucher proposal. It's now being pushed by many on the right. On the left is the idea of matching funds. So John Sarbanes has this uh, proposal, the Government by the People Act, which um, has about 150 50 co-sponsors in the House, which means it's about 70 away from a majority. This bill would say for small contributions, they can be matched by the government up to 9 to 1. So a $100 contribution could be worth a $1,000 contribution to the candidate so that they would be able to run their campaigns raising small contributions only. Again, money from the many, many, not from the point zero two. If either of these two systems were enacted, or if a hybrid of them better were enacted, it's my view that we would solve 90% of the problem of the system of inequality overnight. So the question then is, if that's true, then why is it nothing has been done? And the answer is the number one reason is that the status quo pays in America. It pays. So Jim Cooper, a congressman from Tennessee who first went to Congress in 1983, Describe Washington to me in the following way. He says, the problem is Capitol Hill has become a kind of farm league for K Street, K Street where the lobbyists work. Right? And what he meant by that is that members and staffers and bureaucrats have an increasingly common business model in the back of their head, a business model focused on their life after government, their life as lobbyists. So 50% of the Senate between 1998 and 2004 left to become lobbyists, 42% of the House. And as United Republic calculated, when they looked at the members who left to become lobbyists, the average salary increase was 1,452%. So in a world where people imagine this system as their retirement plan, when they're thinking of their life after they leave government, it's unlikely they have a strong interest in changing the system that would take away this retirement plan. That's reason number one. Reason number two is that people have not demanded it. Now, when you talk to the political experts about this, they say people haven't demanded change because people don't care about this issue. Political last November wrote an article where he said, it's a zero issue. No one cares. They shrug. They already believe that all the politicians are corrupt assholes. It's baked in the cake. They get it. So the view is because we don't care about the issue, we don't demand any change, and therefore there's never any change. But the behavior which people are observing, that people don't show up and demand change, is actually consistent with a very different theory of why people don't demand change. And that theory is supported by data we 
uncovered in a poll we conducted at the end of last year. We said, first, how important is it to you that the influence of money in politics be reduced? 96% said it was important that the influence of money in politics be reduced. So that means there's some Republicans in that number, right? So 96%, Democrats and Republicans alike. But the next question was, how likely do you think it is that the influence of money in politics will be reduced? And the answer is 91% didn't think it was likely. Okay, so, you know, at least 96% of us wish we could fly like Superman, but because at least 91% of us are convinced we can't, we don't leap off of tall buildings regularly. This is the same thing with this change. There's not a story of apathy here. It's not that no one cares. It's resignation. We have accepted a reality we think we can't do anything about. We've changed Ben Franklin's aphorism, nothing is certain but death and taxes, to amend it to include, and a corrupt government. But the key here is that if it's hopelessness that produces this lack of engagement, if it's the view that people have that nothing can happen, then if we can change that view, if we could give them a sense that there was actually hope, we could give them a sense of how there could be change to show them that change was possible, if they could believe change was possible, then that would unleash an extraordinary amount of energy that would be driven to this change to make the problem fixable. Okay, that's the borrowed part. Here's the blue part, which is what I mean by the ending part, which I think should pull this argument together. Okay, so it's 50 years ago that this man, Jimmy Lee Jackson, was murdered in Marion, Alabama. He was in Alabama to help organize blacks to register to vote in Alabama. At the time, Jimmy Lee Jackson was working with others to register blacks in Alabama. One percent of blacks were registered to vote in Alabama. And the reason one percent was registered to vote was that to register, blacks had to answer questions on a quiz. And the questions were questions like, name all 67 county judges. Or, when was Oklahoma admitted to the union? Or my favorite question, how many bubbles are there on a bar of soap? Wow. Now, if you didn't answer those questions correctly, the registrar had the right to refuse your registration, and it was that process that led to the reality that 1% of blacks were registered to vote. So Jimmy Lee Jackson was there fighting for an equal right to vote, and he was murdered for that protest. After he was murdered, the movement was terrified that that would so depress people that it would stop the incredible growth that was happening supporting the change in the South. And so after he was shot, James Bevel, who was the head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, struggled to find an idea that would provide inspiration again. And so he had the idea that they should organize a march from Selma to Montgomery, a 50-mile march, and that that march would so inspire people around the country to the promise, the hope of this movement, that it would recover for the death that Jimmy Lee Jackson represented. But of course, what happened one day into that march was what we refer to as Bloody Sunday, a massacre on the bridge as they left Selma to begin the march. Blood spilled across that bridge, across television sets, across the world, which inspired, finally, the United States to step up and to pass the legislation that would finally assure African Americans this right to vote. Okay, now, in that fight, African Americans had a certain advantage. They knew they were unequal. They got it. Right? In the division of the equals versus unequals in America, they understood which side of that division they stood on. Right? In a thousand contexts of their life, they understood they were treated as unequal. And so they got which side they should be fighting for. The subtle shades of color here helped them see the injustice of their life. But in this sense, we have a certain disadvantage Right? We don't even notice the inequality here. We don't see it. 
By we, we have to be very careful specifying who exactly doesn't see it. Banksy painted this really incredible commentary on life in America on a Boston wall, um, the plight of America right now. When you think about this commentary, whose dreams have been canceled? Who are the unequals in this story? Because obviously, most dramatically, the unequals in this story right now are our kids, youth in America. Youth in America, right? Because if you think of every major problem that we're facing in America right now, think about climate change. You know, climate change is a huge problem. But it's not a problem that people my age will actually ever suffer from. Like, it will be long gone before the real tragedy of climate change will be affected. It will be the kids who suffer the consequences of our inaction. Or think about the debt, which is literally us borrowing money from our kids. We never pay that back. It's they who pay that back someday, many, many years in the future. Or the fact that we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world that doesn't even deliver second-rate health care to most Americans. That's not a problem that I will ever suffer from, or people in my generation will continue to have health care provided by a system. It's a problem that they will suffer from, or an economy that increasingly cannot deliver returns to ordinary middle-class Americans is not an economy that will punish me. It's an economy that will punish them. They are victim number one of the system of inequality, yet they don't even notice this. They don't notice, they don't see, they don't step up to defend themselves against... Who do they have to defend themselves against? Again, defend themselves against us, people in my generation. Tom Brokaw wrote this great book about the greatest generation, by which he meant you know, my grandparents or your great-grandparents, the people who fought the great wars, the people who fought to stop fascism, who sacrificed themselves for what they thought of was the public good. I think my generation is the worst generation. <laughs> the worst generation. Because we have systematically denied a life which is like theirs, a life that demands that we ask, what can we do for the rest of our society and for our children? We have failed this simple test of obligation. We, too, are unequals in this story, our generation, yet we just push that inequality down. We push it down to them, to the next generations. And what I think we need to recognize is that Unequals in every democracy, those who are not the tweeds, in every democracy, need to find a way not to fight apart, but to stand together, and to stand together around this simple principle, that democracy in its essence means no unequals inside the political process. Not no unequal wealth. Of course there's unequal wealth not no unequal speech, of course there's unequal speech, but equal power, equal voice inside of a political process is the principle that for hundreds of years we have allowed ourselves to ignore. If there's an idea that black lives matter in the United States, there needs to be an idea that unequal lives matter too. And if the United States is going to find a way to build the movement that could push this reality into the front, it is that We learn from them who fought this fight 50 years ago. They didn't have the vote, an equal vote. So what they did is they walked and they protested and they fought for equality. We don't have the vote, an equal vote. Not in the ballot election, but in the money election. Not in the general election, but in the green primary. This is the civil rights fight of this age. And what we need to be is inspired by our brothers and sisters who fought this fight 50 years ago and to do it again as they did to achieve the results which they still have not achieved. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you all so much for being here. It goes like this. I mean, there is no patch for ignorance. (laughs) Welcome. 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 
many of you had heard that before? It is an equality problem. And protest, and legitimate protest. <laughs> hey, way to, way to school me. I just showed you how to increase font size, so don't forget the, uh, don't forget the old school hacker here. Viva Innotech, folks. Have a, and, and forward with your, forward with all your deliberations. Will that do, Jennifer? Can I go now? Thank you very much.